So good afternoon and welcome to Company Roots. Today we are interviewing Professor Matthew Carroll, a professor of journalism at Northeastern University. Mr. Carroll was also a former research scientist at MIT's Media Lab for Civic Media, where uh, he helped graduate students create tools for news, newsrooms as part of the Future of News initiative. Moreover, Mr. Carroll was a member of the renowned Spotlight team, in which his team won the Pulitzer Prize for Public Service in 2003 for their coverage on the Catholic priest sexual abuse scandal. That story was turned into the movie Spotlight, which won an Oscar for Best Picture. It is a privilege and we are truly honored to interview you today. My name is Raul Kawuru. I'm a rising junior at St. Paul School in New Hampshire, and I'm the president of Company Roots. My name is Sri Shasti, and I'm a rising freshman at the Wharton School, and I'm from Homedown, New Jersey, and I'm the founder of Company Roots. The, the first question that we always ask is, what are your roots, and how do they help you in shaping your ideas and becoming the person you are today? So are we talking about like my deep roots, my ethnic roots kind of thing, or just sort of where I'm from kind of, kind of roots? Where you're from and how that's, how that's impacted the person you are and kind of like all the things you did before, uh, you know, ending up at the Globe and even with your first career. Okay. So I was always interested in writing from a, when I was a young kid, I loved to read and just the whole idea of writing seemed very, very exciting to me. Um, and um because I tend to be a pretty social person. Journalism looked like a pretty good avenue for me, and it really has been. And I really enjoyed journalism. I love meeting people. I love writing stories. I loved helping people sort of learn more about the world around them. Uh, I was at, the, at a bunch of papers, including the Boston Globe, where I was at for 26 years. While I was at the Globe, I was on the Spotlight team for six, seven years, and we did a bunch of investigations, including the church sex abuse thing, which you guys mentioned that was turned into movie Spotlight. Uh, after that, um, I left uh, the Globe and I went to the Media Lab, MIT Media Lab, for about three years, which really was transformative for me because I think what happens in any profession, if you hang around with all the people who are like you, you start to sort of think like them and everyone, you, you basically within a bubble. But at the Media Lab, I was outside that bubble and I was with a lot of really smart students who were deeply interested in media, but had no background in media at all or communications. Yeah. And because of that, they thought very, very differently about the problems confronting media, which forced me really to start thinking about media and communications in very, very different ways. And I found that very, very exciting. Um, mm -hmm. I left there uh, four years ago and became a professor at Northeastern University where I teach journalism and it's been a total blast. I love teaching. That's awesome to hear. So you're, t you're currently a professor of journalism at Northeastern University, like you said. So what are some of the classes you teach or have taught? And can you s describe some of your takeaways as a professor? Yeah, sure. So, um, so for instance, this fall, I'll be teaching J2, which is intermediate journalism. Um, I taught J1 last term in the spring. Uh, I'll also be teaching storytelling with data, which is basically, okay, you have this thing with all these rows and numbers. How do you find a story there? Mm -hmm. And we work with a bunch of different tools uh, to try to figure out how to find stories again through those in those numbers and columns. I also work with international students. Um, uh, I have a class that's just basically international students and it's sort of, uh, they're all grad level students. The idea is that um, most of them or a lot of them are not only facing language issues, but they've never written any kinds of journalism before. So it's kind of a beginner class to help them sort of help adjust to the world of journalism. It's really fun, really interesting. And I also am the, um, the faculty advisor for Global Observer, which is a online magazine for international students at gobserver.net, which is really, really fun. We started in January and the students have been awesome and they're just sort of kicking butt. Uh, so takeaways. Um, I guess one takeaway is how interested uh, the new generation of students is in um, trying new forms of storytelling. I mean, as, as you guys definitely know, as you guys live, the way that stories are being told nowadays is very, very different from when I went to school. Yeah. And I went to Northeastern back in the 70s when it was basically text and video, and both were very, very complicated to get into any kind of final form. I mean, you know, with press, you had, you know, the, with, with, with text you literally had these massive presses and there was a bunch of steps to, to get it to that form and with video they had these massive cameras and massive editing equipment it was very very complicated to make tv broadcast now everyone can publish in, in two minutes whether you're talking video text 
podcasts, whatever, because everyone has a little mini computer in their pocket and yeah. everything's been transformed. So um, the, the pace of change is just astounding and it's so fascinating. We're really living in kind of a transitional period here as we step from sort of uh, the world I grew up in and now into a very, very different world. And I think that the change will continue for uh, probably several decades. I mean, the the the, inst- the institutions we think of in the digital world, like Google, Facebook, um, Snapchat, whatever, they're all really, really new companies in the grand scheme of things, you know, 20, 30 years. And so uh, there's no reason to think that they'll be around in 20 to 30 years. They could be easily su- supplanted by other homegrown companies, maybe started by you guys right here. So who knows what's going to happen in the near future. But it's just a really, really exciting time for the world of journalism and the world of media. Just It's fascinating to see because things are just changing so quickly and it's just so interesting to, to be a part of it. Yeah. And, you know, characterizing that change over the past 30 years or so, how would you, would you describe it as overall a positive or negative takeaway from, uh, you know, the truth? Um. I mean, it's just change. I mean, I don't even know how to, I, I, I can't really describe it as good or bad. It's just change. We have all these new tools and tools, any tool can be used for good or bad. It's just how you, how you use it. Right. right. And uh, so the change has just been, change is change. I mean, you know, it's, it's just something that happens and we're in the middle of it. And I think it's our job to basically try to, to adapt the change for good as we move forward. Right. right. So, you were a student, you, you studied journalism at Northeastern University as well. So yes. how has that field evolved within that university? So um, when I was there, again, it was, it was text, right? It was text and layout, which is, you know, sort of putting the stories on a page, figuring out what picture goes here and the text and all that kind of stuff, um, which is still um, done, obviously, uh, actually even on phones, um, but it's very, very different. Um, so now we, we're teaching students how to be digital journalists, really, right? So instead of just teaching people about, you know, who, what, when, where, and why, and writing news stories, now we're teaching them, okay, you do podcasts, you have to do video now, you have to do data, data visualizations, um, all sorts of stuff like that. It's just a totally, totally different world. And we're teaching students, both at the undergrad level and the grad level, how to adapt to that. And in terms of, you know, adapting and changing, how do you think the COVID-19 pandemic has impacted journalism as a whole? Well, that's interesting. So um, like a lot of journalists, I prefer to meet people face to face. Yeah. Um, Zoom has made, is sort of a halfway step. So it's not the worst thing in the world. It's definitely better than phone, um, but it's really a halfway step. And still there's nothing that compares to talking to people face to face. And that's, right now is not a thing really. I mean, you just don't meet with people face to face. Um, we've been talking about that in, um, in our own faculty group about how we will have students approach stories in the fall, how we will have them go out um, and interview people. It's, uh, it's a very different landscape. So that has really changed um, for journalism. And I'm talking about journalism as a whole, too. Professional journalists face the very same issues. On the other hand, there really has been this rise in Zoom, which was just really not such a big thing until March when, you know, the, when everything just exploded. Yeah. Um, and Zoom does have advantages. It really does. I mean, you know, we're um, planning a going away party for, um, uh, for the, the group where I was at at the MIT Media Lab. It's all going to be in Zoom. There'll probably be 400 people there uh, virtually. And again, it's not as much fun uh, as, you know, gathering at some local bar or something and, you know, hoisting a few and all that sort of stuff. But it, it is a substitute. So, yeah. yeah, so things have really changed because of the pandemic. Mm-hmm. Right. And you served as a research scientist for the Future of News Initiative at MIT. Um, and can you describe that experience and how you were able to work with students and media partners in working with newsroom tools and kind of shaping their journalism experience? At the, at the MIT Media Lab? Yeah. yeah. So that was, um, that was fascinating because, like I said, the students were really interested in media and how um, it could be used, but they had no experience with it. So they were basically tabula rasa. They were blank slates. They just came into this and they were like, all right, let's create something. So they were just sort of dreaming stuff up um, that 
you know, it, they were just dreaming stuff up that people had not thought of before. And it was a good thing because they were coming at it from a very, very different angle, which mm -hmm. was, okay, I have no background in this. I do have a background as, you know, some kind of tech work and as a developer or whatever, most of them were developers uh, at some level or another. And so they're just like, I'm going to make some tools and let's see what happens. And a lot of them, you know, they just didn't work. They just, you know, I'd, would wor I'd work with them and I'd be thinking, this is just not going to fly. And it wouldn't fly, but other ones worked um, and they were pretty good. It was some really interesting stuff that people were trying. Um, so um, nothing that's still really out there. There's one and I'm blanking in the name, which uh, killing me. I'm blanking the name. Hopefully, hopefully I remember it. But um, the... Uh, what came to me out of that whole experience was that we need a whole other generation of entrepreneurs to basically reinvent media and storytelling. And uh, this is a great time to do it because another thing out of the ep epidemic has been the revenue carnage for media companies. They're just getting wiped out. Uh, advertising has been wiped out, which in some ways is not the worst thing in the world because there's a lot of really crappy media companies out there right now. And I tell my students, if you have any entrepreneurial bent at all this is an awesome time to be a journalist because you can start a newsroom somewhere whether it's sort of focused on um, a geographic area like a like a traditional town paper or some kind of niche publication focused on a topic like i don't know archaeology or whatever and this is an awesome time to dive in because you have all these old media forms that are basically dying and yeah. you can create new ways of doing things and really really just start kicking some butt out there it's a great, great time to be a media entrepreneur. Mm -hmm. So if, let's say you were, uh, you know, fresh as an intern in a high school, right? And you're working for a uh, local, local, local paper, right? What yeah. topics would you cover on the township level? That is a great question. Um, Asking for so It's interesting. My wife works for a small weekly uh, around here, around Boston. And um, people are still interested in what they've always been interested in. So they're interested in how is the town being run? How is my tax money being spent? So they're inter they are interested in the, the old fashioned kind of meetings that are happening, you know, the city council kind of meeting or the planning board, which, you know, allows different stuff to get built around town because people are interested if, a, you know, if a, uh, a hundred room apartment building is going to be built on that vacant lot across the street from, right? That's a big deal. Yeah. So um, they're interested in that kind of stuff. But the question becomes, okay, we have all these new tools for podcasts and videos. How can we help people in town um, become more savvy media consumers and actually media producers, right? Because they, it, it's a two way street now. It's not just one way where media is pushing stuff at, out you, at you. Now it's a two way thing. So how can you use these new tools to help engage the people in your community uh, yeah. with your organization and to provide a more democratic experience for people? Yeah, interesting. Um, so one of the things I was actually, I was thinking about when looking at your character in Spotlight, um, mm. was so you're a former reporter that special. Look a lot better with makeup, by the way. <laughs> you you specialize in, in database projects, right? Yeah. And uh, yeah, you know, you you said it about the movie. They actually make, uh, you know, making a spreadsheet, which is unbelievably dull and boring, into like a sexy thing. So, right. how would you go around, you know, organizing data effectively to communicate your idea, and then making it that you know, that sexy level that they represented in the movie. So I did this a little bit at the Boston Globe. And um, one of the things, I assume this is doable in most states. It's definitely doable in Massachusetts because I did it. Um, so say you're covering a local town, say the town of uh, Carrolltown, right? I'm, I'm making up a town. And um, one thing you could do that's really, really easy is compare Carrolltown to other communities around you. Yeah. Um, and uh, for instance, the state publishes all these numbers, just huge numbers of, of, of huge piles of numbers all the time, which are basically ignored by media companies. They're used often by people who work for towns, mm -hmm. but not by other people. And so, for instance, you can compare the taxes in Carrolltown to the, you know, the, the six or eight peer communities around you. You can compare um, the percent of tax money that goes to schools, the percent of tax money that goes to police departments or fire departments, how much the healthcare costs by yeah. average per person in these towns. There's so much data available. 
And when I was at the Globe, um, I worked for the Zones, which covers basically the greater Boston area. And every week we published what we called Snapshot, which was exactly that. It was very, very simple. It was a bar chart with 158 towns. It's actually broken into smaller tranches, so like 50 or so per different zone. Uh, but basically, you could see how your town compared for, you know, on property taxes. Um, and it got um, a huge amount of interest. I mean, you know, bar charts are as simple as it gets. But because they're so simple, everyone understands them. And it was a really nice tool so that people could say, okay, I can see that my town pays a lot more in taxes on property taxes than our neighboring town. Why is that? And uh, this would become, you know, a topic at town meeting. My father actually ran a small town <laughs> uh, outside of Boston uh, at that time. And he was getting grief at town meetings. And he'd say, your son is publishing these charts. My father's like, oh, my God. So, uh, but people really found the charts to be useful. And so that's a very, just a very simple um it's a long answer to, with a very simple answer, with a long, a long answer, but the answer is very, very simple, which is you can do some, some really cool, interesting stuff with, with data um, yeah. every day if you want to, um, if you have the time. Yeah, yeah. So uh, shifting more towards like the movie Spotlight, how yeah. would you say the movie portrayed the facts of what really happened and emotions running through your team? Yeah, I, the movie did an awesome job of showing what happened. And they, I mean... It's not, it's not a documentary. They told us when they were making it, it's not going to be a documentary. It's a movie. We're going to change some stuff. So some of the timelines were a little screwed up and they took, uh, I shouldn't say screwed up, but the timelines are a little different. And they took two or three people and they made them into one person just to, you know, uh, make the storytelling a little less convoluted. Mm -hmm. um, but all in all, it's a really amazing job of storytelling. And um, one of the things I really liked, for instance, was the spreadsheet scene. I, I, in the, we, we got the script, but I, I don't even know what it said about the script. Maybe we just said spreadsheet scene because no, there's no dialogue, but it lasts three or four minutes. And it really does a nice job of showing the tedium of creating a database by hand, but also showing the power of that database when it's finally compiled. And, um, you know, that's what journalism often is. It really can be really, really boring. You have to dig and dig and dig to find that little tiny diamond of hard information that you can wrap a story around. Yeah, uh, they did a really nice job of that. And actually, you know, then I, I've been watching movies with my friends every day just before I go to college. And, uh, you know, the, the day before we watched Spotlight, we watched a movie called Bad Education. Uh, I'm not sure if you've watched it. No. It's basically yeah. about this whole embezzlement scheme that happened in a, uh, a school district out in New York, I think. They were, like, they were like number four in the nation. They were doing really, really well. But oh, I've, I've read the reviews about this. Yeah, it sounded very interesting, yeah. Yeah, it, I it's think Long it, Island somewhere, right? What happened? Long Island somewhere? Yes, yes. Yeah, yes. okay. And you know, you know, it was doing it was doing amazingly well from all all sides except people were ignoring kind of the the, the guy who was doing the accounting for uh, the bills payable and everything was kind of ignoring his job and you had a couple of people up or like in the higher higher up in the district they were embezzling like millions of dollars uh, you know, of money. And then so what happened was one high school girl was just digging through public records, just trying to find things. And yeah. she ended up going and showing up an entire like $11 million scandal. Um, so that that kind of, you know, it really showed me like, wow, investigative journalism is like amazing. And it's yeah. kind of that we don't have more of it right now, but I, I feel like I, I want to try to revive that type of thing in my community. Cool. Because, yeah, my, I don't know if where I live is the the best in terms of like, transparency um but one, one of the things i wanted to ask you about you know your your investigative journalism was how would you describe the effect of your stories on the catholic church because you know having the data and putting it all together that's one part but you know having the conscience to put it forward and knowing the effects that it'll have on other parts of the community you live in i think it's another thing to consider and what are tangible steps of reform that there are to take so it's interesting when you when you're a reporter. I mean, you're you're conveying information to people. And you're trying to take all these little strands of information that you find and and put them into a um, a coherent ball of string, basically, so that people can find it easy to understand something. Yeah. And so most of the stories we do affect a relatively small number of people, or if they affect a large number of people, it's in kind of a small way, so that the impact 
Sometimes it's pretty big, but it's usually with a relatively, again, a small number of people who are directly impacted and they will tell you they're happy, they're sad, they're pissed at you, whatever. So this was very, very different because Boston is the biggest Catholic major city in the country. It's 53%, you know, we're we're great at Boston. It's just a a very, very high percent. And this thing landed like a bomb Mm -hmm. and um, it was uh, transformative. I mean, it really, really changed how people viewed a lot of different things, including the people who worked directly with their kids. And so at one level, it had major changes in the Catholic church, which totally changed, um, at least in Massachusetts. And I I know in a lot of other parts of the country, how uh, priests deal with kids, how the the people who inside the church work with kids, how, you know, how they're handled. For one thing, you know, now they require that, uh, at least in Massachusetts, that you get fingerprinted at your local police department, they check to make sure you're not a sex offender, that sort of thing. Um, so that was a very, very tangible result. Um, I think the church has become a little more open, at least locally. Uh, we have a pretty good cardinal. Um, it's not hard, to, it's not easy to make change in an institution that's more than 2,000 years old. It's re- it is really, really difficult. And frankly, at the, at the papal level, I don't really know how much impact there's been. There's been definitely some cosmetic changes. Um, I don't know. It's just, it's very difficult to change an institution like that. I, I, um, yeah. But we'll see what happens. I mean, as far as people who attend a church, huge changes. There's very much more. They're demanding a lot of changes. They've gotten changes. Um, and even beyond uh, the Catholic church, uh, as I mentioned, like I, um, I'm a, or I was a sports coach, right? Because when my kids were growing up, I'd help coach baseball, all that kind of stuff. And uh, as a direct result, or partly as a result anyways, of all those stories, um, all us coaches had to sign all these forms and get fingerprinted and all that kind of stuff. They checked out. It's nothing to do with the Catholic Church, but again, people were like, okay, well, if it's happening at the Catholic Church, it could be happening in youth sports too. So um, if you know coaches who've been fingerprinted and all that kind of stuff, it, it's kind of at least indirectly uh, as a result of that investigation. Yeah, and uh, some of my friends and I, we were discussing it after, like, why is it that the Catholic Church has it compared to you know, some other religions, it's not, it's not as huge of a thing to see this happen, but with Catholic church, it's like, I feel like I hear it all the time. And the answer we kind of boiled down to was uh, uh, chastity, like the fact that they can't get there. Yeah, yeah, that's one of the problems. It's also very centralized and most religions, I, I can't think of another one that is um, as centralized as the Catholic church, right? I mean, basically all Catholics report to the Pope at the end of the day. I mean, they report to other people, but that chain goes right back to the Pope. And uh, so we, uh, my wife and I still go to a church, or we were going to a church before COVID, and it's a, um, it's a basically a local church. It doesn't report to anyone. Yeah. So if there's a problem there, it's settled at the local level. It doesn't go beyond that. But the Catholic Church, you know, it's centralized. And so, um, and they were very adept at covering these stories up and had been for centuries. Mm-hmm. Um, so yeah, it's a very different kind of organizational structure. Yeah, yeah. So we always end on the same question in our interviews. Um, what advice would you give to the current generation of high school students that would like to make a positive impact on society, including the field of journalism, where they can um, effectively write about and show their show the truth? And how do you recommend they start this process? Okay, so. Um, at a very practical level, you know, we've been talking about tools and my advice is learn as many tools as you can and pick up as many skills as you can. Um, you know, obviously writing is important, but video, podcast, data, data visualization, you know, get as many tools in your tool belt as possible. It'll just make it a lot easier for you to get hired. Um, it's yeah. as simple as that. Um, at a more general level, just keep asking questions um, at just don't stop. Just ask questions, questions, questions. Don't settle for what people tell you. Keep digging, digging, digging. Mm-hmm. Um, and, you know, I'm not saying that there's a scandal in every story because there's not. But um, you, there are scandals out there and you can find them and you can write about them if you keep digging. And frankly, mm-hmm. the more you dig, the better your story is going to be. So just dig, 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 dig. Uh, yeah. Keep asking questions. Yeah. All right. Well, thank you, you know, for coming on this interview with us today. It's been an honor to interview you and you know, hear your perspective. It's definitely different from what we hear 